Hello everyone, Golden Nova here. Lightning Overdrive has made its debut in the OCG, and it's a very auspicious time. It's the fourth set of the year's rotation of core sets, capping off a whole year of dual developments, design decisions, and perhaps most importantly, lore. Historically, these sets show the climax of the current story arc, tying up some loose ends while dangling a few more to build anticipation for the beginning of the next one. Crossed Souls saw the Zephyr appear at the last minute to stave off the Infernoid invasion, as well as Dante escaping the Burning Abyss. Shining Victories included the final duel between Master and Vector Pendulum, as well as the final chapter of the Cosmo Space Epic, and Maximum Crisis was the blockbuster hit that showed off the final battle between Spiral Super Agent and a Sleeper Agent. Mentor versus Student, as well as the True Draco Collective fending off the True King of All Calamities, which we've all been fighting against ever since. So how does Lightning Overdrive stack up? That's what we're here to find out. We'll start by going over the new theme, Stigmata, then dive into the rest of the plot-related cards, explaining what they do as they come up. It's time to see what's up with the Stigmata. But before we continue, a quick reminder to please like and subscribe if you've enjoyed my content so far. We're on the road to 5,000 subs and you can help make it happen. I've got a very special explained video I want to do to celebrate that particular milestone, but I'll save the details for that when we get to 3,000. We've also got a Discord where we've passed a bylaw that War Rocks are considered Amazons, and a Twitter where you can stay up to date on channel news and my bad takes. Thank you for your patience, and now, back to the video. Before we get into the new theme proper, I need to front load a bit of a disclaimer. Stigmata is a term that anyone who's kept up with the story so far knows about, but it is technically paratextual, which means it's information that's not from the source material itself. The Stigmata is mentioned in a V-Jump article introducing the Dogmatica, but no card until now has actually mentioned it by name. Well, almost. Sources from the lore channel of my Discord have let me know that the kanji used for Stigmata previously isn't the same as what's used for the new cards. So keep in mind that throughout the video, the Stigmata here is not the same as the mark given out by Maximus to confer power to their initiates, but it is related in some way. The current theory is that Albaz has the base version of the power, while Maximus has some kind of offshoot that they've manufactured for their own purposes, but that remains to be entirely confirmed. Okay, with that out of the way, it's time to introduce Albion, the Stigmata Dragon, a level 8 dark dragon fusion monster with 2500 attack and 2000 defense, requiring Albaz themselves, plus a light monster. If they're fusion summoned, you can then fusion summon a level 8 or lower fusion monster, except another copy of itself, by banishing material from your hand, field, or graveyard. Also, during the end phase of a turn they're sent to the grave, you can add to your hand or set a Stigmata spell or trap from your deck, which is noticeably different from the rest of the Albaz fusions. Normally, you're grabbing a monster it's associated with, but that kind of gives the game away. Stigmata is all about enabling and enhancing the Albaz fusions themselves. Even Albion can help you make a different one immediately after it's been summoned. Which just goes to show you can't judge a book by its cover. Albion may be all spikes and magma, but they do love hanging out with their friends. Next, we have an actual, honest-to-goodness fusion spell for our fusion monsters, Stigmata of White. It's a normal spell that lets you fusion summon any monster using material from your hand or field, provided at least one material is a dragon type. However, if you use Fallen of Albaz, you can also banish cards from your grave as well. Lastly, during the end phase, if Stigmata of White is in the grave because it was sent there to activate Albaz's effect, you can set Stigmata of White to your field from the grave. Spoilers, this effect is going to be a constant among the Stigmata spells and traps. This honestly solves a lot of problems with Albaz themselves. Don't get me wrong, a super polymerization on legs isn't anything to sneeze about, but looking at how specific the other half of the Albaz fusions are, counting on your opponent to have just the right one is a big pain. Now you can actually use your own material as well as pulling from the grave to help mitigate the specificity. It also confirms that Albaz is a huge country fan, what with the burning rings of fire and all. Stigmata Ominous Cry is a normal trap you can activate on a turn a fusion monster was sent to your grave, and when you do, you can special summon one of your banished fusions or one on your grave. This card definitely takes advantage of the ability to reset to the field better than Stigmata of White. If you discard it for Albaz's effect, you get it right back, and if your opponent gets rid of that fusion monster, you just flip Ominous and get it right back. But this can also be useful in other fusion-based decks. Shadals, for instance, love summoning and sending Construct to the grave to trigger their effects as many times in a turn as possible, and it's much more useful in this deck since you don't have to wait until the end phase to get the benefits like with the Albaz fusions. Now, you may be asking why I'm focusing on how it works in other themes and not its own, but I'll be honest with you, this is all just one big cry for attention. Our last card is Judgment of Stigmata, 
another normal trap that has you targeting a level 8 or higher fusion monster you control on activation. On resolution, you destroy all monsters your opponent controls with an equal or higher attack than that monster. That's, uh... That's something. It feels weird and bad at first, but the more I thought about it, the more I liked it. To me, it feels like a weird disconnect to have a board wipe that destroys everything stronger than the chosen monster, but that does mean that nothing's left around to get in that fusion monster's way, so that's something. And resetting it with Albaz means you'll be ready to bring the pain to anything with 2500 attack and above. The lightning here is also similar to the lightning found in Dragma Punishment, which further implies that Albion is wielding the power of the Stigmata in some form. And we can take this even further. In Punishment, you send one monster from your extra deck to the grave to destroy one monster your opponent controls with an equal or lower attack, but Judgment has you using an extra deck monster on board to destroy everything your opponent controls with an equal or higher attack, and that's the kind of parallel you make when you want to drive home a point. However, it's not a counter trap that negates and destroys at the cost of a lot of life points, so this is a 0 out of 10 card, as it does not adhere to the years of Judgment canon that's already been established. Now, from what we can gather, you're not really supposed to make a pure build out of these cards. Rather, you can add them to several fusion themes, bringing along a suite of extra fusion effects, removal, and revival. So how you use them is up to you. The door's wide open. Now, before we get into the lore, let's go over some updates to older strategies that we've already gone over in this world that don't really have a huge bearing on the story. Kind of like Tri Brigade Bear Bloom, the Solid Assault. They're a Link 2 Fire Beast monster with 1700 attack, requiring two Tri Brigade monsters, and they let you discard two cards to special summon any of your banished level 4 or lower Tri types, which I think is really cool because it simultaneously loads your grave with more monsters for the Tri Brigade patented grave linking, while also recycling any that you've previously used for said grave linking. Also, if they're sent to the grave, you can add any Tri Brigade spell or trap from your deck to your hand, then put a card from your hand on the bottom of your deck, kind of like her big sister. It's also got the same blue aura that all Tri Brigade equipment has. Are we ever going to get an answer for this? We've also got some Spriggans updates. Spriggans Brothers has all the usual traits for their theme, and is a level 4 with 300 attack and 1800 defense. You love seeing those machine dupe stats, but ironically you don't really want to use it for Brothers. If they're sent from the hand or deck to the grave, you can special summon a Spriggans in your grave, except a copy of itself, making it a very good target to send with Spriggans Watch. It's an all-around good consistency piece that really helps make these fires work. Spriggans Merrymaker is a rank 4 with 1100 attack and 2000 defense, requiring two level 4 monsters. If they're special summoned from the extra deck, meaning they'll trigger even if summoned by Gold Golgonda, you can send a Spriggans monster from your deck to the grave. Also, during your opponent's main or battle phase, you can banish Merrymaker until the end phase, then if you do, and it had two or more material, you can send a fusion monster with Fallen of Albaz as its listed material from your extra deck to the grave. So not only can it set up more Spriggans in the grave to load up as material, or to search with Bangar, you can also send Splin to summon any member of the Spriggans team, or even Albaz. And hey, considering how easy it is to make rank 4s in general, you could run it in Dogmatica and Tri Brigade to trigger Titanoclad and Brigrand respectively. They weren't kidding about this being a merrymaker, cause it's making me feel pretty jolly. Alright, that about covers everything on the peripheries. Let's get back to what everyone's been waiting for. Last we saw our heroes, they were aboard the Spriggan ship Explorer, having encountered another of the mysterious holes. The opposite ship shown in the art of vast desert gold Golgonda doesn't make a further appearance, largely scrapping my theory that we would see more of Theo, but in its place is an even more fearsome adversary. Out of nowhere, the Supreme Arch Serpent Golgonda rises above the dunes, its massive, twisting form eclipsing the ruins that dot the landscape. They're a level 8 fire reptile with zero defense, and if Gold Golgonda is on the field, their question mark attack becomes 3000. You can special summon them from your hand or grave so long as you have any face up card in your field zone, but it's banished when it leaves the field. It can also protect Gold Golgonda once per turn if it would be destroyed by banishing a monster from your grave. Mechanically, the Arch Serpent is a great boon to Spriggans, protecting its most valuable card while making easy material for Explorer. But now it's their greatest bane, especially considering the markings along its body. The hole, etched multiple times into the creature's flesh, but why is it all the way out here? Has it been lying in wait to snack on adventurers who wander this far into the wastes? Perhaps. 
It's also possible that Dogmatica had corrupted the Serpent long ago, as a way to hunt down the Spriggans that had allied themselves with the Tri Brigade. However, I have another theory. It seems odd that the second ship makes no further appearance in this arc, so why did they bother introducing it? I posit that the Dogmatica faithful aboard the ship possess the power to mark creatures with a hole in some way, much like Hashashian, and the one found in Spriggan's Call wasn't some random occurrence that they happened upon, but the finishing touches on a brand meant for the Great Serpent of Gold Gonda, meant to finally hunt down Albaz and Ecclesia. Having come face to face with their most imposing challenge yet, I imagine Albaz and Ecclesia are at a loss. What weapon could harm such a massive foe? But the duo have each other, and perhaps that's enough. It's hard to say what exactly triggers the transformation. The impossible odds are certainly a factor, but perhaps instead of reacting on hatred, instinct, or fear, Albaz faces the danger ahead with resolve. Suddenly, in a flash, a symbol, four conjoined rings of flame, perhaps fueled by the fires of the Spriggans, and their glow is mirrored by the four gems on Albaz's person, ones we've seen from the very beginning, and thus we are introduced to the Stigmata of White. Albaz assumes their dragonic form once again, becoming Albion the Stigmata Dragon, perhaps their truest form. The spikes and wings that can be found on other forms fit the aesthetic of this version much more closely. Since this form was introduced alongside a fusion spell for Albaz, it may be that this form came about without absorbing any external forces, though since the other material is light, it may mean that Ecclesia either gave him some power, but without projecting any thoughts or expectations onto him, allowing him to transform unabated, or her presence gave Albaz the strength to accept this form without hesitation or anxiety. Whatever the case may be, Albion rockets through the sky, and in a massive bolt of lightning, takes out the Arch Serpent. And on closer examination, this figure as well. I haven't been able to identify them, but they seem to be Dragonic in nature, and I wouldn't be surprised if they were the one responsible for the Great Snake's corruption. Spriggan's booty shows what ought to be the aftermath of this attack. It's a continuous spell that has an effect similar to Gold Golgonda. When a face-up Xyz monster you control leaves the field by a card effect, except during the damage step, you can target an effect monster your opponent controls, and for the rest of the turn, neither player can activate its effects on the field, even if Booty leaves the field. Also, you can send Booty to the grave to activate a Gold Golgonda from your deck or graveyard, so now you have even more ways to access it. The group celebrates a job well done, the Spriggans reveling in a load of treasure, presumably from the Dogmatica ship that brought forth the Arch Serpent in the first place, Albaz is rather pleased with themselves for their accomplishment, and Ecclesia is gleefully touting what I presume to be the skull of the Arch Serpent of Gold Gonda, though much smaller without being empowered by the whole. It would seem that, with their past behind them, there's nowhere to go for this dynamic duo but up. But elsewhere, things are not quite so cheerful. I have been blessed with so many wonderful gifts. I have been blessed with the holy relic Nexus, so I may spread God's power and wisdom to the masses. I have been blessed with weapons and armor of immeasurable power, so as to smite the wicked. And perhaps most of all, I have been blessed with so many wonderful, attentive, dutiful children who see to it that God's will is followed by all. But sometimes, even the most devoted among us stray from God's path, especially with such heinous, blasphemous influences just beyond our borders. It's a shame, really, that they have gone so far to rebuke the loving hand of the Divine. But despite their mewling protests, the chosen children of God must be brought back in line. And heathens must be purged before becoming any more of a nuisance. Having been informed of the defeat of the Arch Serpent and the awakening of Albaz's Albion form, Maximus decides that even more decisive action must be taken, and so opens up the largest hole yet seen, with a pit much darker than the purple ones from before. This is Dogmaticus, a ritual spell for the Spellcaster Faithful. 
It can ritual summon any Dogmatica ritual monster, tributing monsters from your hand and field whose total levels equal exactly the level of the ritual monster, or you can send a monster from your extra deck to the grave with the same level as the ritual monster you wish to summon. However, for the rest of the turn after Dogmaticus resolves, you cannot special summon monsters from the extra deck. But who has been chosen to fall victim to this most sinister of spells? Unfortunately, it's one of Ecclesia's closest friends. Dogmatica Albaz Knight is a level 8 light spellcaster ritual monster with 500 attack and 2500 defense. While they're on the field, you cannot special summon monsters from the extra deck. If your opponent activates a card or effect, you can send a monster from your extra deck to the grave, and if you do, look at your opponent's extra deck, send a monster from it to the grave, then Albaz Knight gains attack equal to half the combined attack of the two monsters sent to the grave with this effect until the end of the turn. With this, you can send popular options like Natis to the grave in response to a card's activation so that it can be destroyed on a new chain, as well as taking an important card out of your opponent's extra deck before they can access it. But since you're locked out of the extra deck the entire time it's around, you better have your deck built to commit to such a play or have a way to turn off its effects. The artwork here is absolutely gruesome. Fleur de Lis armor is ravaged by multiple hole marks, and several draconic features are beginning to appear taloned feet, clawed hands, and a new pair of arms grown from their back that have taken over the job of wielding the sacred sword and shield, both of which have also been influenced by the whole. But perhaps the most noteworthy detail is the name, Dogmatica Albaz Knight. Up until now, we've called Albaz that name because we didn't have a better name to call them, but they're technically the fallen of Albaz. This previously implied that they had originated from a nation named Albaz, but if being possessed by the whole has made Fleur de Lis an Albaz knight, does that mean that it's a title that has something to do with the draconic aspect of the stigmata, as opposed to the saintly, pure-appearing version distributed by Maximus? And what's worse, the skies above show two more holes have opened up. Who knows what other terrors are in store for the country of Dogmatica now. And still, that may not be the worst of it. While there's not currently any proof of this, there are too many connections to the lore to ignore this last card, as it may show Maximus is heading into the fray themselves. Dracrown of Mysterian is a level 8 light spellcaster fusion monster with 3000 attack and 1500 defense, requiring a spellcaster and a dragon. It cannot be used as fusion material, and loses 100 attack for each of your banished cards. If a monster or monsters are special summoned by the activated effect of a monster with the same type as them, even its own, you can target one of those special summoned monsters, then banish it and all monsters on the field with the same original type as that monster. Let's go through this monster piece by piece to make the connection. Maximus is also a level 8 light spellcaster, and their battle stats are the reverse of Dracrown. They require a spellcaster and a dragon, which would fit the mold of Albaz, or perhaps the draconic aspect of Nexus, merging with a member of Dogmatica, namely Maximus. Its inability to be used as fusion material seems to be some kind of defense against Albaz's effect, which is even more curious because Dracrown is a viable fusion material for every single one of the Albaz fusions. Its 3000 attack is more than enough to make Titanoclad, its level 8 status could make Brigrand, if it's still fusion summon they could make Splend, and it's a light for Albion. Losing 100 attack for each of your banished cards is odd, but makes sense in terms of distancing itself from the other themes. Tri Brigade banishes for their grave linking, Spriggans banish their Xyz monsters plus Bangar for searches, and even the new Stigmata of White can banish cards as fusion material. The more ground Dogmatica gives to these other factions, the less powerful Dracrown becomes. Lastly, their mass banish effect is devilishly powerful against monotype decks, but while mechanically strong, has a lot of drawbacks thematically. If you played this against another Dogmatica deck, or spellcasters in general, you'd end up banishing Dracrown themselves, which may be a reflection of the self-destructive power of their tyranny. It's not very effective against Tri-Brigade due to their diversity of typing, showing the strength that comes from accepting and bolstering the things that make us different. Spriggans would be notoriously difficult to get this effect off against, as it won't trigger when the field spell summons their Xyz, though I'm not sure if there's a lesson there. And against Albaz, well, each fusion is built in such a way as to counter Dracrown in case you use Albaz's effective fusion summon for them. 
Albion can just make a whole new Albaz fusion, neither Splend nor Burgrand are dragons, so the effect won't trigger on them, and in the case of Burgrand, can actually prevent the effect from triggering altogether by keeping them from targeting your monsters, and when Titanoclad hits the board, they're unaffected by the effects of extra deck summoned monsters for the turn, making the effect moot. It's strange, while Dracron likely isn't competitively viable, it's still very strong but it feels like it was designed in just such a way as to not be good against these specific themes for flavor, which is a pretty bold design decision if it was intentional. However, this is all just conjecture, and we'll have to wait a few more months to see if any of this investigation holds water. But it would seem that Maximus is poised to take the fight to Albaz and Ecclesia, and finish them off before their power can grow to even greater heights. But we're also left with more questions than answers. What is the true nature of the stigmata, and for that matter, the whole? Is Albaz an ancient country, or the ultimate fate of those cursed by Maximus's mark? What became of the Tribrigade, and where does their technology come from? Who is this new saint that was anointed, and what is their purpose? What was the mysterious figure that was flying by the Arch Serpent? What will be the ultimate fate of Fleur de Lis, and will Aiden and Theo follow? And what is Mysterium? Honestly, my guess is as good as yours, and I'd like to hear what those are. Let me know your theories, no matter how plausible you think they may be, because the more we share, the more we can discover. And if this is the first of my lore videos that you've seen and you want to watch from the beginning, or you just want to binge them all over again, I'll have a playlist right here that'll get you started. Thank you all once again for watching, and until next time, I'll see you in the next tale.